Well, thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks everybody for coming. And um, I don't know if you know who we are. I recognize a few familiar faces in the room, but my name's Evan Cernofsky. I'm a reporter with the San Francisco Chronicle, and I cover criminal justice issues here in San Francisco. I'm Marisa Lagos. Um, I cover uh, state politics for KQED News, the local NPR affiliate. I worked with Evan before, actually, before defecting to public radio. And um, I'm going to move my mic a little because I'm a radio reporter who can't work a mic. Um, <laughs> and I have um, just sort of a, I mean, professional and personal interest in criminal justice. I've been following a lot of the reforms at the state level. And so um, I think. The district attorney thought we would be a, a, a nice mix of uh, questioners because we've got the local and the, and the state perspective. And, you know, first of all, I want to thank uh, both Marisa and uh, Evan. They, in my opinion, are incredible reporters, but more importantly, they're really smart people that know how to ask hard questions. And uh, Marisa has been punishing me for the last five or six <laughs> years. <laughs> uh, and Evan's is doing great work. Uh, I also want to thank uh, everyone here today uh, my staff for your incredible work. You know, everything that we do wouldn't be possible without you. I want to thank my beautiful wife here um, who makes things go for me and uh, certainly my friends in the public defender's office and other department heads and elected officials. Thank you so much for being here today. Great. So, so I guess we yeah. should probably just jump right into this. And we're looking at our notes on our phones. We're not checking Facebook, just so you know. <laughs> I'm checking Facebook. Okay. Well, he's a slacker, but yeah. So one of, the, one of the major issues that's happening right now has uh, been officer-involved shootings. And just the Sunday before last, we saw a particularly tragic episode in Sacramento where an unarmed African-American man was, um, was shot by police there in his own, on his own property. And I'm wondering given the history we have in San Francisco, given your office's role that you play with officer-involved shootings here, do, do you just have any reaction to what's happened over there? Well, I do. I mean, actually, it's really, there, there are multiple things that come to mind. First of all, I think some of you are aware, but for those of you that are not, uh, when I came to the office, uh, there were a lot of things about officer-involved shootings that were concerning me. Uh, one was the way that we didn't make public the, uh, the, our investigation, so I immediately started to make public our reports. And then the other thing that really was, became very obvious to me is that the, the, the quality of our investigation was so much predicated on resources that we did not have. And in order to try to bring the right level of resources, it took quite some time. Um, but then there are other things that I really, uh, you know, I have a problem with and I'm really, you know, I continue to wrestle with this and this, in general, police use of force in this country and how do we come to a different place. You know, I think that we have, uh, the, the, the way that the laws are currently written and the way that police officers are trained and, and led, uh, it really has taken us to a place where a police shooting may be lawful even though it may not be necessary because of the way that the laws are structured and, uh, you know, per capita, as well as the raw numbers, we have more, more officer-involved shootings, and we, quite frankly, have more citizens killed by police than any other nation in the world. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of that gets visited upon poor communities. Although we know that actually in national numbers, the majority of the people that get killed by police are not minorities, are white, but, but the, the, a lot of the more controversial shootings uh, and then we have a lot of mentally ill people that end up dying at the hands of police use of force. And a lot of it is driven by police training, the way that our police officers are being trained and led, and because the law permits that. So we, we are, I think, as a nation, we're, at a, we're at, a, at a juncture that what has been is no longer acceptable. And how do we move to the next level? And how do we bring a different level of uh, accountability to police, but also training and support for police officers so they can do their work safely, but not necessarily engaging as much lethal force. It is going to be really, really important. And I think that the time has long passed and we need to get that done. In San Francisco, um, the DA's Office Independent Investigations Bureau is supposed to be taking the lead on officer-involved shootings here. Is that happening already? No, it is not. Uh, you know, unfortunately, we have been wrestling with the, uh, with the police union. Uh, you know, this was uh, the, the city and the union determined that this was a meet and confer item. For those of you who don't know what a meet and confer is, basically, 
under labor contracts, you know, you have to negotiate with, uh, with the employee groups. And the police union has taken a posture that this is, a, is, a, is an area that needs to be negotiated. And we haven't moved very far. So we still, even though we have the unit and we're doing, you know, as much independent work as we can, we do not take the lead in these investigations. Uh, and it's still very problematic in many, in many aspects. So I'm curious, can I just follow up? To, so there is state legislation, um, I know, that has been killed a few times, largely because um, police officers have a very strong lobby in Sacramento that would require outside independent investigations. You know, we've seen the Attorney General step in in the Stephen Clark case. Um, do you think that legislation is necessary? And more broadly, does there need to be statewide police reform? There's another bill that's set to be introduced next week around um, just allowing more information uh, about investigations and misconduct for police officers. Yeah. Uh, let me begin by saying that I, I, I believe that actually uh, police use of force investigations should be done by completely independent entities. And I'm not sure that even local district attorneys are the right entity to do so. The problem, especially in a state of our size, is that logistically it would be very difficult to have a, the Attorney General, for instance, having a team in every major metropolitan area because when you have an officer involved shooting, you need to respond within, quite frankly, within an hour or two. The first eight to 10 hours are critical in the investigation. And if you don't have a team on the ground that, that has the expertise and is able to get there, you're gonna start missing a lot of pieces. So what we try to do here is after, quite frankly, negotiating and asking the AG at the time, uh, now our state senator, uh, to take over this investigations and understanding why she was reluctant because, again, the logistics that I mentioned, we said, well, the second best thing is for us to create an independent unit. And what we have done is actually move away from our traditional prosecutors. So the unit that we have are prosecutors that do not work in our criminal division. They do not work day in and day out with the police department. In fact, they come uh, with experience. Some of them came from the Justice Department, uh, and, and they're used to investigating police work. Uh, but I, there's no doubt that it's still the public doesn't feel that investigations conducted even by IIB are independent mm -hmm. enough. And then because you have you overlay this with the state of the law and how, you know how difficult it is to prosecute cases that even they may they may appear to be on its face uh, unnecessary. Uh, because again, the standard is not whether they were necessary or not, right? It's a, it's a standard that is complicated, but basically you have, uh, you know, you have a subjective standard, which is what the officer felt at the time, uh, you know, and you know, was it reasonable or not? And then an objective standard was how would a reasonable person under the same situation feel that this, uh, you know, that this shooting uh, was proper or not? And then because you don't have to retreat, you have your stand your ground laws and all these things. So, you know, basically the, the shooting gets judged by what happens in the last few seconds as opposed to everything that led up to the shooting. What do you think um, should be done differently in San Francisco? And do you think the new use of force policy that focuses on de-escalation here is the, is the right way to go? Yeah, and I think, you know, by the way... Or is the, that enough? Yeah, I, I think by and large, uh, most of the reform when it comes to police use of force really has to come from within training and policy within police departments. You know, by the time you have a shooting, it's really too late. Um, and a lot of the shootings are really precipitated by, by what I consider to be training that needs to be uh, updated, you know, and, and not the way that it is. So I think that it is important to have a different policy. I think that the emphasis has to be in the escalation. I think the emphasis has to be in the, you know, respecting the sanctity of life and that the force that is going to be used should be only the minimum and necessary force. You know, I often used to tell people, and, and I think it's very relevant today, you should not use force because you can. You should use force because you must, or, you know, which is a, it's a tremendous difference. All right. We could talk about this all day. But <laughs> we I can. think we'll move we on. Yeah. Um, sure. Um, so, Going a little bit away from use of force, and you know, particularly those are uh, involving violent situations. San Francisco right now is still in the throes of one of the worst property crimes, specifically auto burglary right. epidemics we've ever seen. Thirty-one thousand auto burglaries in 2017, right. up 25 percent from already staggering numbers. Eighty-five a day, average of one about every 15 minutes. Um, I know that. You've tried to tackle this issue and come up against some challenges. What do you think that the city needs to do going forward? Yeah, well, I think, you know, first of all, I think the story of property crimes, and especially auto burglaries in the city, is kind of a good news, bad news. The good news is that the most recent numbers that we're seeing is we're seeing 
some significant reductions. I believe that the police department is conducting better investigations. Leadership around this within policing has increased tremendously. There is more visibility. There is more attention to the work that is being done there. Um, I think that the bad news is still, you know, we have a very large number of these cases and, and unfortunately very few arrests. I think, you know, if you go back uh, to the numbers last year, uh, it was about 1.3 percent of the cases that led to an arrest, which is very difficult to hold people accountable if they're not, if there's not some accountability there. The other part that I is important to know is that uh, in my office, it, we, you know, we created the Crime Strategies Unit, you know, several years ago. And part of the work there was really to become more thoughtful, more data driven in, in the work that we did. Um, and because of the, the, the work that we have done around analytics, we were able to identify a lot of things. For instance, that our, our car break-ins are really driven primarily by small groups of people that are working together. Most people would think a car break-in is, is a drug addict in the corner breaking into a car randomly. That really isn't what we're finding. We're finding is that the large majority of these cases are groups of people that are organized, and then they, in turn, are going to organize fences. And as we saw in the case in Santa Clara County, then the property is actually being exported to other countries. Interestingly enough, we we identified a suspect a couple of years ago and provided that information to policing. Um, so what we want to do is we want to continue to work in a way that we can look at these individuals rather than look at them as a single car break-in, understand that the person that is being arrested has probably committed many other car break-ins, is working in a larger group, and try to connect the dots. And that's one of the reasons why uh, I put a single prosecutor that was dedicated to this work a couple of years ago, but we realized that that's not enough. She's, you know, her success rate is very high. Uh, we're taking action on about 82% of the cases that are brought to us, but clearly not enough. So I've asked uh, the mayor and the board of supervisors to fund a unit, and, and quite frankly, I've made it very clear, you know, fund it for a couple of years, uh, because if the problem goes away, then, you know, we don't need to have this many people, but it really is focusing on having an analytical team working with the prosecutors that can put these cases together in a way that doesn't do the traditional prosecutor work, which is basically a passive recipient of work from the police and taking one case at a time. And instead of doing that, taking the case and looking at it and saying, okay, this case is probably worth many other cases, and I'm going to look and I'm going to dig to try to see connections with other cases. There seems to be an effort by some of your detractors, uh, particularly folks in the um, Police Officers Association saying that the DA doesn't prosecute these cases. Um, first of all, is that true, or is is there any point? That, are, are you too easily moved to cut a deal with somebody, or? What is the reality of that situation? Well, I mean, look, the reality to begin with is that out of about 31,000 cases, there were a little over 500 arrests, right? And 82% of the time, we, we prosecute or took action in those cases. Um, you know, we are doing, we're working within the law and doing the things that we need to do. Uh, I think that the problem is, it's a larger problem. I mean, you know, when, it's a hu I think it's human nature. When things are not working well for you, it's easier sometimes to point the finger in another direction, and I think some of that has taken place. Um, and we have, you know, we work really well with the police. We're working really well with the command staff. We got some new captains that are coming in doing incredible work. If you look at, uh, for instance, Northern Station, you know, huge reduction in property crimes in the last two months, uh, Central Station. So there's a sort of, it's a new evolution of the work uh, and because of the work that we have been doing with CSU is so tightly connected to the inspectors and the sergeants in the field, we provide them a lot of information. The actual, the, the working relationships are, are, are really uh, resulting in much better results. The other part of it too is that, you know, the community is an important component too. So one of the things that we put together in the office, we've put together a working group that's not been going on since last year where we have SF travel, we have the hotels, we have the Chamber of Commerce, we're now bringing in uh, DPW, we're bringing in uh, MTA, uh, obviously the police and us, and we're, we're meeting monthly and working regularly, identifying what are the things that we can do. Because basically what, the way that, that we need to look at this is there are really three legs to the stool. First one is prevention, and how do we prevent this case by educating the public and see what are the things that they can do to minimize the likelihood of victimization. The second one is intervention, what are the things that we can do to reduce the likelihood of crime. So that goes into, for instance, in our parking garages, which most of our car break-ins are occurring, is improving lighting, 
cameras, security around the, the, uh, those parking garages. And then lastly, and really the last resort, is the arrest and prosecution. If we do really well with the first two, then the last one becomes the one that we can really focus on those people that are just consistently victimizing people on over and over again and be much more effective. So Evan mentioned sort of criticisms from police here, and I know you've been a big champion of some of the statewide criminal justice reforms that we've seen in recent years. Uh, the realignment law, Prop 47, which lowered some crimes from felonies to misdemeanors. Um, I guess I'm curious if you're concerned, because in addition to some of the things we've already covered with you know, what, what's happened in San Francisco and the Bay Area around property crimes. We're seeing a concerted effort by some of your colleagues, district attorneys and other places, to really uh, roll back some of these reforms through the ballot box. Yep. Um, I don't know, are we at a moment here, and, and as someone who's championed these, are you worried that, you know, property crime, like these sorts of statistics kind of give them ammunition for that with the public? Yeah, so look, I mean, I think as human beings, it's, it's hard for us to, to do things differently, right? I personally grew up on the war on drugs, uh, war on crime. I was, a, I was a warrior, right? I view myself as a police officer in that thin blue line that I had to go out there and make as many arrests as I could. Um, and I did that for years. And uh, for me, it was an evolution. I, I began to, to get to the point as I educated myself that there were several things that were happening. Number one, the work that we were doing was not necessarily good socially or economically or even good for public safety. So my commitment and my passion has always been how do I make a community safer? Uh, and in doing so, you have to look for ways that actually that's gonna work better. And, and I came to the conclusion years ago that the, the war on drugs was, was, was a failure. It was a failure in many levels. It was a failure because it didn't, didn't necessarily make us any safer. It wasn't really contributing to public safety, to the, to the contrary. It was costing us a great deal, and both socially and economically, and not getting us anywhere. But more importantly, the law is supposed to be equitable, equitable and fair. And I think that very few of us would argue that drug use in this country is, uh, is, is equal across the distribution lines of gender, economic boundaries, and racial. But when you look at who are the people that are being arrested, prosecuted, and imprisoned, are mostly people of color, mostly African Americans. So you have to start thinking, number one, we're doing something that is not really making us safer. It's breaking the bank. We're not building schools, but we're building more and more prisons. And on top of that, we're really singling out a, 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 our poor communities, and we're decimating those communities. So that really led to, you know, to many of my push for uh, criminal justice reform, including Prop 47. Interestingly enough, I think there are several things that often are not safe. Number one, Prop 47 doesn't deal with car break-ins, right? Car break-ins are not part of Prop 47. Number two, Prop 47 really was geared towards lowering the consequences for drug possession and drug personal use and some of the property crimes that generally touch upon drug addiction and mental health. And then more importantly, we have study after study that's showing that Prop 47 has not caused a crime increase. In fact, there's a recent study just came out of UCI a couple of weeks ago that shows that you know, across the state, you have areas where crime has gone down, you have areas where crime has gone up, and you have areas where crime has been flat. If Prop 47 was a cause of increase in crimes, then you would see crime going up everywhere. That hasn't been the case. And then finally, if you look at the last 20 years, we have tremendous crime reduction. We continue to stay in that, you know, sort of that arena of, uh, of the, the crime numbers. So the whole idea that Prop 47 is causing crime to go up is really not supported by the evidence. But again, I think it goes back to human nature. We were used to doing things one way, and all of a sudden this is being shifted, and quite frankly, very abruptly, and people are very unsettled with this. You mentioned something that I think is important, which is the disparities within the criminal justice system. Um, you know, we've had before you a previous district attorney who talked a lot about that issue. We have you championing these reforms and, and articulating that, but those disparities are still persisting in San Francisco. Right, yeah, and it is unfortunate. In fact, uh, you know. I mean, what can you do? Like, well, so here are some things. I mean, interestingly enough, we just finished doing an analysis of our work. Uh, and Prop 47 actually has cost the, the largest reduction in the disproportionality uh, impact, uh, the disproportionate impact of the criminal justice system on African Americans. 
So the numbers are heading in the right direction. That's kind of a good news story. The bad news story is that, for instance, if you look at the African-American population, San Francisco today is around 5%. But if you look at the people that were arresting and prosecuting, it's very close to 50%, right? So there are still huge problems of disproportionality that are being caused by you know, economic and social conditions and, quite frankly, a history of, 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 uh, of system bias, I'm not going to say individual bias, but system bias that continues to permeate uh, the way that we do our work. One of the other big issues that's going on right now around the state with criminal justice reform is bail reform. And we've got the Humphrey case that was just recently um, ruled on. And you have your own interpretation of what that law means. Can you explain to folks a little bit about how you have read this law and what your office is doing now yeah. um, with regards to um, detention hearings? And sure. So let me, let me go back because I think it's important to put context to it. When I became the DA very early on in 2011, uh, I began to explore the way to start reducing the impact of money bail on the system. And I did so because um, I'm convinced, but there's a lot of data to support this, that there is, no, there is no correlation between having money and being dangerous. You could be a wealthy person and be very dangerous. You could be a poor person and not be dangerous. And what money bail results in often is that is the person that cannot afford to post bail the states in custody, regardless of whether they're going to be dangerous to public safety or not, whereas somebody that can afford bail is going to bail out even though they may be dangerous. So clearly, money bail had no, no relevance to public safety and certainly was very unequitable. So I started working with the Arnold Foundation and we began exploring ways of bringing a risk assessment tool to San Francisco that would start reducing the, the, the reliance on money bail understanding that by the state constitution we're required to provide money bail. Um, that led us to 2016. We actually, uh, you know, with the concurrence of our public defender's office and, and, our, and our bench, uh, we created, a, a, you know, we calibrated the Arno uh, risk assessment tool for use in San Francisco. And the early results are very encouraging. You know, over, uh, first of all, we have reduced pretrial incarceration by about 60%. Uh, 90% of the people that were released uh, on, on the PSA tool did not commit another crime while they were out pending trial. 86% uh, of the people that were released on the tool came back to court. Quite frankly, those numbers are much better than the people that live on the traditional money bail system. The problem that we have now is that the courts are coming back and saying, in, in, in the Humphrey case, and, and there's, you know, and then we got another case actually out of San Diego that is contradicting this. It basically says, you know, um, you cannot use bail to hold anybody back, traditionally, and, and very problematic. I'll accept you, but we have used money when we have found somebody to be dangerous. The the, the proxy for keeping somebody behind bars has been by raising the bail to an amount more than they can afford, which is why I wanted to go to risk-based tools. Uh, now we're in a place where um, the, the state of the law is in flux. There is a lot of ambiguity. Uh, we, we have a local decision that basically says you cannot hold anybody basically unless they're a flight risk, and even that, there's some questions to it, and the money that bail, if you're gonna, if you're gonna post money bail, it has to be something the person can afford. So if I can afford five bucks, that would be your bail, but maybe I get released and I'm dangerous. And what I'm doing, actually, I'm, 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 uh, I'm writing a letter to the Supreme Court. Actually, we're, we just finished a letter to the Supreme Court. We're asking for review on, on this case and because we need to bring, basically what we need is we need a system that has clarity, that allows for people that are dangerous to be held back if that's required, assuming that there are no less intrusive methods like, you know, uh, ankle monitoring or some other tool, and allows for people that are not dangerous to be released immediately, and, they, and then they can go on to come back at a later date and have their day in court. So our public defender's here. He's been uh, on the other side of the courtroom on the Kenneth Humphrey case, and this was a man who was accused of entering his neighbor's room, stealing a bottle of cologne, intimidating the man. Um, I'm just curious, like, that, you know, feels in some ways like the type of case you might champion publicly when you're talking about some of these reforms as the example of somebody who should get out and yet your office has fought yeah. to keep him in and he is still behind bars even though 
From my understanding, this appeals court decision has resulted in other defendants being released under right. the court's reading. Right. Um, I don't know, is there a disconnect between the sort of policies that you're pushing and what's actually happening in the courtroom in these well, cases? Well, you know, this is obviously is a case in pending litigation, but I think it's been oversimplified than breaking into somebody's room and stealing a bottle of cologne. But we have a man that has a, a long history of criminal behavior uh, and sometimes violent criminal behavior. Uh, this person did break in somebody's home and the person that is a victim was severely traumatized and there were, you know, it, it, was, it was a physical thing. Uh, the bottle of cologne and the, the money that was taken, it was the only thing that this person had. Um, and, and we are, f and by the way, our victim was very fragile, very, very vulnerable. Um, and, uh, and we're afraid that because of the history in this person's life, and the fact that he's done prison for similar behavior in the past, is that he would, if, if he gets released without any clear conditions that he is going to reoffend, and he is facing a severe penalty. So I know that this case has been portray portrayed as a you know, simple theft of a bottle of cologne. It's much more than that. It's a home invasion robbery with a high level of violence yeah, by, by a person they, that has yeah. a long history, a long criminal history. I guess my point is more that I think it's easy to say I support reforms, but on individual cases, you have a role to play. You're a prosecutor. Right. Um, you know, you are representing the people in these cases. Um, so if even like a case like this, and, and I understand it's complicated, and right. I think Mr. Adachi would say, well, he had a drug treatment program to get into, but we don't have to get into all the details. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's just more broadly, though, um, you know, it, does this case indicate that there are still problems with the way that San Francisco and other counties are looking at bail versus PSA, this tool, um, and, and just, and, and, and how difficult it is to actually realize some of these changes when it comes to individual cases. Well, I think it's important that, you know, my job as a prosecutor is to protect the public safety, right? Our friends in the public defender's office, is a, their job is to protect each client's right, or, or, or certainly for any other defense attorney. Reform, I don't find that reform and, and public safety are disconnected or that they should be at odds. There are going to be people that need to be held back. There are people that are going to have to be incapacitated in a variety of ways because they are dangerous. And I don't believe that because I am pro-reform um, that that means that we're just going to simply let dangerous people out on the street to hurt others. I do believe that the levels of intervention that we provide should be the minimum level of intervention to get the work done. So even in the case of Mr. Humphrey, if we can find less intrusive ways to ensure that he doesn't hurt other people, then that should be it. But that, that exploration hasn't quite happened uh, in a way that I'm satisfied because I, I am responsible for other people's safety, right? That victim that is tremendously, tremendously traumatized um, you know, I don't want to see somebody else suffer the same consequences, right? And there is nothing in Mr. Humphrey's background that tells me that I should feel comfortable with him just being allowed to leave without, you know, some further review. So I, I think, you know, sometimes people sort of translate reform must be against public safety. It's not. I think they're both congruent. In fact, I think that if we lower our incarceration level, especially with early stages, we're less likely to have dangerous people later on. You know, our prisons and our, and our jails take low-level offenders and make them into very dangerous people, right? They're universities for crime. So there are a lot of things that we can do to make ourselves actually safer than we are today, but that doesn't mean that we're going to look the other way when we think someone is unsafe in our mind. And, you know, we're not perfect, right? We're human beings, and obviously there are a lot of other factors that come into play. We continue to try to remove our personal opinions, but they, they, they certainly come in. Now that the Humphrey case has happened, we're seeing more people released than before. Correct. Is San Francisco equipped to do this? Uh, a lot of the times they're sort of uh, released on their own recognizance or said they have to go and pick up their ankle monitor on right. their own. Whether or not they do that is up right, to right. them. Is San Francisco, does it have the infrastructure right now to handle all these people who are in pretrial? Um, detention? No, no, we don't. The, you know, our pretrial, the, the, the uh, pretrial diversion uh, nonprofit is terribly underfunded. Uh, they're not equipped to do this. And by the way, we're not unique. We're actually in a better place than many other counties around the state. 
I think that in order for us to, you know, to do this well, we also have to realize that we're going to have to spend more time and efforts and money in pretrial diversion tools in, you know, so that we can have the right level of monitoring and the right level of supervision for people that perhaps are in the, in the medium risk level, right? You, you know, I hate to simplify this, but if you can think of three buckets, you got dangerous people, should not be released. You got medium level dangerousness that needs to be closely supervised. And then you have people that are very low level and, and quite frankly, those people, you're better off leaving them alone. If you supervise them, they get worse. Um, and we are not doing very well in that mid-level because we don't have the resources to do this. And that is another area that is going to have to be addressed. Are you confident with the Arnold tool? I know that, um, you know, we've talked about implicit bias in policing. I think right. that these risk assessment tools come with potential pitfalls of their own. There was um, a really interesting investigation ProPublica did about yeah. some of the other tools. And one of, you know, the criticism of Arnold is that it's been, it, their methodology is a little opaque. Um, and I, I, I think they've said that they're going to open that up more. But I guess yeah. broadly, are you happy with the way it's working? And is this something you would say recommend to other jurisdictions? Well, I mean, uh, I'll start with the last question because it's easier. I, would I recommend a yes? Is it, is it, have we arrived? No, I mean, I think we're a long way from having a perfect tool if, we, if, if, if that will ever be the case, but I think it's much better, and there's a lot of science behind that tells us that these tools are still better than our intuition and our gut. Uh, yeah, in fact, there was a study, I think it was Columbia that just published recently, that compared uh, algorithm results versus judges' results, and the judges were wrong about 40% of the time where the algorithm, the, the failure rate was less than 10%. So I think this is a work in progress, and I think it requires continuous calibration, continuous uh, review. We all have to feel comfortable with it. You know, uh, there are going to be parts of the tool that the public defenders feel very uncomfortable because they think it treats their, their clients unfairly. There are parts of the tool that our prosecutors get scared because they say, how can we let this person go? And then, you know, the judges are going to fall in either somewhere in, the, in, in those two universes. But what we know is much better than we were doing before, right? Since we started using the tool, we increased our pretrial release by 60% and our post arraignment release uh, somewhere I think is around the 20 percentile or so. And very good results about the people coming back and people not reoffending. So it's much better than we were doing before, but it needs to continue to be uh, developed. We need to continue to look at the areas where there are shortfalls that need to be improved upon. And you're absolutely right that there is no question that part of the tool uh, may be impacted by, by, by um, you know, biases that are set in the system. By the way, the advantage about the Arnold Foundation over the stuff that ProPublic looked at is not, uh, the Arnold Foundation is a nonprofit. Uh, it's, a, it's a foundation that really has come to be in about criminal justice reform. And while you think, you know, they're less opaque than the others. They're really trying to put all their information out there. Um, so it's a much better than the other ones that we have seen out there that come from with for-profit motivations. Mm -hmm. Going back to some of the reform efforts um, you've been spearheading in the D district attorney's office, there's also been an effort to reform our police department. The, um, the Department of Justice stepped in famously and issued a report for 272 different report, uh, reforms. Uh, the state AG's office has since stepped in. Um, what's your assessment of how some of that is going? And also, um, there's a ballot initiative, Prop H, yeah. on, on the coming ballot that would um, usurp the current uh, taser policy right. for police with um, a more lenient uh, policy. Yeah. So, I mean, look, actually, uh, let me handle the taser first. I think it's an easier answer, and then I get into the other one can be more complicated. Uh, first of all, I'm against the, you know, bringing police use of force and police use of force tools to a ballot measure. I think that the right place to handle this is as it was handled. The chief of police, the police commission, and the community stakeholders working out a policy, which, by the way, I, I happen to believe is a much better policy than the policy that would take effect if Proposition H were to pass. I think also I'm, I'm very worried about um, having a police use of force tool be put on the ballot and be placed on the electoral process because it's subject to, first of all, it's subject to all the, 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 the misinformation that sometimes goes into the electoral process. But more importantly, 
I think there are a couple of problems that I see there. First of all, this is purely driven through one lens and one lens only, and that of uh, you know the, the police uh, officer association. The, the level of force that, that would be approved by this, I think, is less than what it would be this community would feel comfortable with, and we have to be mindful of that. And then, and then the problem is that technology and tools are evolving all the time. If we actually pass this policy through the ballot box, and then a year from now somebody else comes up with a better tool, or, or there's an evolution of policy and use of force, the only way that you could reform that is by going back to the ballot, which makes no sense at all, as opposed to having the police commission, the chief of police, and, and the community doing what they should be doing, like in the case of the policy that we now have. And then finally, look, I think it becomes irrelevant. It's moot today if you consider that the, the officers are going to be equipped with a taser. And I say all this in light of, look, I am a proponent of the officers having tasers. I think some of you may recall when I was the chief of police, I. I argue with the police commission and many members of the community that the officers should have the taser. Given the current technology today, that is one of the best tools that we have available, but it's not a tool that is a free for all. It's a tool that has to be controlled through proper training, proper supervision, and it has to be really limited in the application to people that are violent. Donna. Um, and really just not. yeah, going going back reforms. to s some of the other larger reforms. I mean, sorry, yeah. the um, the police union is also negotiating a new MOU, which is due in I guess the end of June, yeah. um, and have been often recalcitrant about um, accepting some of these reforms, as you mentioned, um, wanting to go to meet and confer, and. Um, and, uh, and are still do, doing that now. What's, right. what's your assessment about how this process is playing out? Well, look, I, I think this, um, you know, I'm hoping that the mayor and the board of supervisors take their role seriously here, right? The, uh, I understand that the union probably has a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, legislative support to, to push a lot of this reforms into the arena of negotiating on the meet and confer, but I think we as citizens also have the right to ensure that our police department, uh, their standards of practices and policies and training and all that are conforming to our standards and our norms. And I think that the place to do it is through this negotiation process. You know, where they're negotiating salaries and working conditions. Well, this is part of the working condition. And, and you know, one of the things that I tell people, uh, and I, I say that sincerely, uh, us, meaning public servants, you know, we're here to serve the public. It's not the other way around. Uh, I understand the union has a different role. The union is not really there to serve the public. The union is to serve their membership. But when there is a when the when the the needs and the and the uh, the interests of the public is going to go in a different direction, perhaps as to what the personalized needs of the union or the membership are, then I think that the public needs and and, and desires are need to be the need to be what what drives the the conversation. Um. Well, let's move on to something more fun. Um, we've talked a lot about the POA. We could probably talk about that all day too, but um, one of the things you've gotten a lot of attention for both in and outside the city recently is how your office is handling Prop 64, um, the marijuana legalization, and this idea of going back and sort of automatically scrubbing people's records. Um, can you talk a little bit about like what brought you to, to the point of making that announcement and, and sure. what you're hearing from other jurisdictions? Because I know that some are following San Francisco's right. lead. And how is that going also? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, well, first of all, you know, again, if we kind of go back a little to what I said earlier about the war on drugs and the impact of the war on drugs on, on communities of color, uh, marijuana certainly is a classic example, right? I mean, I think that, you know, marijuana use is very prevalent across, <laughs> across every group. Um, it's questionable whether it should be a, a classified as a dangerous drug as it is uh, under Schedule 1. But what is really clear is the voters in California made, made a decision that they were tired of, of you know, criminalizing marijuana use. They legalized it not only several years ago for medicinal purposes, but now for, for personal recreation. So we now have the tool, we have the will of the people, so the question is who should bear the burden of, of actually uh, having the opportunity to reduce the, the impact that the arrest and the prosecution in this case has had. And you have to understand that when you get a criminal prosecution and a conviction, 
uh, there are a lot of things that start to be not available to you. Sometimes public housing, sometimes employment, education. Uh, it's a scarlet letter that goes on forever and ever. And if now we have a, a, a legislation that allows to remove those scarlet letters from people, then the question becomes who should bear the, the burden? Should we have poor people that may not be able to afford an attorney to go to court and do a petition in order to take this off, where we as prosecutors, quite frankly, much easier than the defenders can, we can just simply automatically start removing this from the book. So that's what I did, uh, and we'll continue to do so. Do you guys tell so. the person? I'm sorry? Do you guys tell the person? Actually, we cannot tell the person sometimes because we may not be able to locate him. I mean, the person can check with us, right? Um, but what we're doing is we're taking all the misdemeanors and we have come to an agreement with the courts and we're going to start batching them in batches of 100 a week. Um, we're basically, we're just taking those things out of the records. Now, on the felony side, it's a little more complicated because you have to review the individual's uh, uh, criminal history to see whether they qualify or not. So we're working with some other partners trying to see if we can create some algorithms that will read the rap sheet to kind of give us a quick read and then we will go and confirm if that's the case and then we can go and reduce the, the consequences because if you had a felony conviction, you can get it down to a misdemeanor. If you had a misdemeanor, you can just take it off your record completely. Um, the, the great news is that not only this is going to be, I believe, a, a, a great service to our community here, but other DAs around the state and interestingly enough, other parts of the country now uh, where marijuana is legal are starting to do the same thing. So hopefully San Francisco started a trend um, that I'm proud of. All right, maybe one last question before we wrap this up. <laughs> um, immigration is such a huge issue right now. Obviously our, our president has very different views than a lot of San Franciscans do about that. What is your office doing um, when it comes to undocumented uh, defendants and how do you guys handle this? Yeah, so, you know, and I, uh, you know, I'm a little careful because uh, as you get older, you have more stories, and I could go on every one of the areas that we talked about, and I could tell you about a story that led me to be where I am today. But I think in the case of immigration, uh, it's one that I, I wanted to perhaps begin by giving a little bit of a background on this because I think it illustrates a point. When law enforcement, local law enforcement, engages in immigration reform, I'm sorry, in immigration enforcement, you, you create a, 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 a division where people do not trust local, local law enforcement, and increasingly they will be less likely to report crime, and that impacts everybody. When I was in Arizona, uh, I, very early on, I was confronted by uh, some community members, actually, uh, a, 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 the consulate office of another nation. They had a national from that country, a woman, young woman that had been brutally raped, um, and she would not report the crime because she was afraid that if she did, it was not in my jurisdiction, it was in the county jurisdiction, she would be deported. She was even afraid to go to the hospital because in Arizona at the time, if you went through an emergency room, you could actually be reported to immigration services if you, if you could not show that you were authorized to be in the country. So she didn't, uh, and we worked together, we were able to get her some medical services, uh, but there was never a crime report, even though the suspect was a known suspect, uh, about six months later, this individual went out and raped again another woman, this time a U.S. citizen. Um, and, of course, then he got arrested and eventually he was prosecuted. The point to me illustrates how by having people not participating in the system in the early stages, you're impacting everybody else's public safety. That second woman that got raped shouldn't have been raped, right? I mean, no, nobody should be raped, obviously, but not by this individual. This could have been stopped earlier but it wasn't because of the, the, this toxic environment. So what we're doing here is we're, first of all, we're seeing that because of what is going on at the national level, we're seeing the reduction in, in the reporting of crime. Domestic violence reporting has gone down in our jurisdiction, has gone down in other jurisdictions as well. We have people that are afraid to come to court. So we started to do several things. First of all, in the office, we created a system to provide safe passage where we could for victims and witnesses to come to court. Uh, we work also with our partners in the defense and uh, in, in Senator Weiner, you know, creating legislation that would prohibit both sides, the defense or the prosecutor, from bringing somebody's immigration status in front of a jury in an open court unless it was relevant and it had to be uh, reviewed by the court beforehand. And, and then really just going out to the community and, and telling them over and over again that their immigration status is not, is not an area that we're going to dwell on because that's not part of our work. 
One of the more famous cases involving a, a person who was in the country illegally was uh, Jose Inez Garcia Zarate. That case, um, in many ways, may have helped propel Donald Trump to the presidency. He used it as one of his flashpoints, and um, famously recently he was exonerated on most of the um, homicide charges in the, the Kate Steinle uh, killing. Have you had any thoughts about this um, in the months after it's happened? Yeah. Well, look, I mean, let, let me begin by saying I'm a father of two young women, and, and every time that I looked at the Steinleys, I, you know, I had this horrendous thoughts about what would I do if it was, if I were in their place. And I have to tell you, the Steinleys are incredible people. They're, 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 they're incredible human beings, and the way they've handled this, uh, and, and they handled the, the tragedy of their, their daughter's death, which that by itself should be enough, or more than enough for any family. But then they had to deal with all the stuff about immigration. You know, at the end of the day, the Steinle case, or Sorati, was a murder case. You know, and tragic as it may be, we handle murder cases and we, we, we know how to deal with those. This case was politicized by Mr. Trump and his administration and others, and continue to be so. And I know there were death threats against the public defender. Uh, I certainly got a lot of hate mail on it. Um, and then, you know, we looked at the case from the very beginning as a second degree murder, uh, possibly a manslaughter case. Uh, as the case evolved, at one point, the prosecutor handling the case and the, uh, and the judge agree, saw it as a, as a first degree murder. So when the instructions were given to the jury, that was included, that, was, that really wasn't part of the early discussion, but it happened and, and uh, it was agreed upon. And then the jury came back and disagreed with, with us and basically felt that there was not enough evidence to prove any theory of murder, first, second, or manslaughter. And we live in a nation and you know we have a system of laws that we respect and I respect the uh, the jury's decision on this. I will never second guess a jury. Uh, introspectively, we look at us and say, what could we have done differently? And certainly, you can always look back and say, well, perhaps we could have done this and not that. Uh, but uh, other than learning from and moving on, I would say that you know we would have prosecuted that case again today for second degree murder, given the same set of facts and what we know, or what we knew at the time. Uh, and you know, unfortunately, the jury disagreed with us. Is there any issue that you think coming forward um, that San Franciscans should be aware of? You are sort of famously have taken on bigger projects beyond just right. prosecuting cases. Yeah. What are you looking at? Well, you know, there, there are several things. I, you know, one of the things that I'd like to continue to convey is that criminal justice reform and public safety are not, are not in conflict with one another. In fact, Criminal justice reform is about public safety. It's about looking for the right level of intervention in order to keep our community safe, do it in a, in a way that is socially and economically responsible. Um, we will continue to evolve. You know, Our crime strategies unit increasingly is getting better. We're bringing more analytical support. Uh, I'm hoping that we get funding for this unit to deal with car burglaries because we do have a crisis now. And if two years down the line this, this is no longer a crisis, then you know that money should go back. I think that we need to continue to, and will continue to work to get rid of money bail. I think it's, a, it's something that time has come for that. Um, we believe in technology. I'm a great believer in technology, so we continue to look for ways to improve our work. Uh, you know, with this still the issue of disproportionality in the system is one that, that bothers me greatly. So we're going to continue to work in, in ways to deal with this area. And then finally, you know, the area of police accountability and police reform is one that we will continue to work with the police department because, by the way, I think police reform needs to also come from within the departments about training, leadership, and we want to enhance the ability of the police department to do the work. Um, you know, I was a police officer for many more years than I have been a prosecutor. I know how dangerous a job can be. I know how important it is to have a good police department. And I'm, I'm the greatest supporter of good policing. I can ask them by when I see unconstitutional policing. And that's where, you know, that's where we're going to have some areas to work on. But I think, you know, the, the, the work that the majority of the men and women of the police department are doing is very good, and we need to continue to provide them the space to be able to do so. So I think what you will see moving forward is, you know, a continuation or, or, or work with the police department to improve their, their practices and their work, 
uh, a continuation of the evolution of our technology to do much better at what we do. Uh, I'm expecting big crime reductions this year, quite frankly, because I, I see a different buy from the police department and what we're trying to do. Hopefully we'll get the right funding level. We're really looking at uh, dealing with human trafficking. This is an area that you know, keeps me awake because you know, we are one of the centers of human trafficking in the nation. Uh, and most of it goes unreported and, and, and quite frankly is in our face, but it's not dealt with appropriately. And again, this is an area that we know that we need to do a lot better. So we're really looking at how do we create a new environment around human trafficking. Um, and we'll continue to move forward and learn and evolve. Thanks for your time, District Attorney. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.